Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. Welcome into the Sports Fanatic News Baseball Show. As I'm joined by a special guest I haven't talked to for a long time. Used to do the West podcast with him. And over time, Heroics, he still does great stuff over there. So check out his baseball podcast. But we're talking to Alex Clark, a huge Seattle Mariners fan, as they made some great moves in the offseason pre-lockout and are rumored to make even more post-lockout. How you doing, Alex? You know, Joe, it is always great to hear your voice. We used to do a lot of fun stuff over there with OTH, and the fact that you get to be on the mic with you once again is an absolute treat. Yeah, yeah, it's nice to have you on. I've been, I had to pull away from OTH with how much hockey coverage I do for other sites between three levels of hockey and the hockey season when there's not COVID affecting those teams. Um, but <laughs> uh, definitely um, <clears throat> has been a fun thing to do, and I'm hoping to try to find something similar. Um, baseball wise, because that would be really fun as well. But enough about me and enough about uh, our own things. Um, like Alex, for example, having one of the most fun jobs in the land, video game tester. So maybe uh, we can pick his brain about that a little bit at the end as a fun, just interesting <laughs> section. But first, we'll get into um, the big thing of a move that hasn't been made yet. But just because it's always good to talk about speculation to kick off a show, it always gets people's ears up and makes them feel warm and fuzzy inside when you think of having one of the best shortstops on your team. Um, what do you think of the news that the Mariners offer Trevor Story a contract pre-lockout and the fact that since it seems like he might take one of those more bridge deals to try to reprove himself because he hasn't been good defensively of late and then go from there. It, it, the Mariners seem like a pretty good fit if that's the case. So what are your thoughts on the overall uh, Trevor Story news about that? So when it comes to Trevor Story, it's kind of interesting because with him overall, um, if they go for a bridge deal, then it makes even more sense for Seattle. Right now, Seattle does not need a shortstop. Seattle already has J.P. Crawford, who they've already kind of said that He's our main guy in the future. He's the guy that Seattle wants to kind of build around. They see a lot in him, and to be fair, I see the same things. He's a great guy, a great personality around the clubhouse, but he's also one that wants to be a leader and has proven himself to be that. So they're not looking to move away for, from J.P. Crawford at all. For this kind of deal, they would end up moving uh, Trevor Story over to third base, which I think was part, one of the points of kind of contention of why a, a deal was not made before the lockout. So they put, like, so they're going to go for him and try and make him a third baseman, which to me makes a ton of sense. He's a guy with a ton of athletic ability and one that has a great power bat, which in Seattle, definitely something that Seattle needs a little bit more of. But the, guy, the deal overall makes sense. Do, do I think it's going to happen? There's a good chance especially with Seattle being right there on the cusp of being that playoff team and snapping this 20, you're about to be 21 year uh, playoff drought. So I think it makes sense for both parties involved, especially if story, it really does kind of want to put like a one to two year deal um, on the table just to try and, you know, get his name back up, ready to go. But it's going to come down to whether or not he's willing to gamble on himself and whether or not he's willing to move over to third base. Because right now, Seattle's already made it very clear they don't want to move J.P. Crawford around. No, and and, and I wouldn't because he made that insane. He's, he's been very good fielding in, in, in general and um, really getting better at that side of the game. But he makes those really good rangy plays. Like we saw the jump, Jeter-esque jump throw, um, where... Uh, I wouldn't move him either, where Story makes the most sense at third. His range with his recent so – he's had a couple leg injuries and stuff, um, has not been as squeaky clean. So it just makes the sense to move him there. I agree with that, where his bat also plays more like a third baseman than it does a shortstop anyway. So that that works out if you put him at third base. I feel like Trevor Story has a chance of being the simian of this free agency, where it's like, let me completely re-up my stock and then bounce on it after I go back in either this year or because I feel like if he takes a two year deal, it's going to have a one year opt out in my own opinion, where then it's going to be his own decision of do I want to stay with this team for the second year or do I want to bank off of the year that I just had and then go back into the free agency. Now that's just my own take um, on what it would be. But for what you were saying 
about like the couple year bridge deal, what's your ideal contract that you, if you were the GM, put yourself in the shoes of like being the GM of the Mariners right now, like what would your ideal contract be? Since it seems like he's kind of that bridge deal type guy to reprove himself fully as we know what Trevor's story can be. So I've tried to put myself in the mind of Jerry DePoto on a number of different occasions that it never turns out well. But <laughs> um, look, <laughs> well, here's what I think overall. Like when it comes to story, if he wants to take that short term deal, go for it. But I will say I'm not a huge fan of the one year then opt out. That's not what they're looking for. What Seattle's looking for right now, they're looking for people that can help them get to the postseason in 2022. Which, you know, Story's definitely a guy that can do that. They were about one to one and a half, two games shy of the playoffs this year. This is a team that was not expected to do as well as they did, and yet they knocked it out of the park. And so it's going to be really interesting to see what they go with them. But when it comes to a deal for Trevor Story, I have a feeling it could be a three-year deal with an opt-out after the second. Because I feel like they need at least two years with him before – because they, they've also got all these other guys coming up through the minor league system. One of the guys that's still a ways away, but one that they're going to be looking to groom to potentially get here as soon as possible is that Noel Marte kid. He's still a ways away. Do not, give me, do not get me wrong. But at this moment right now, they want someone that's going to work well in the short term, but longer than just a year. Because they don't want to just have that rental player type idea. If they want, if they want to get... Uh, Sorry, I would recommend putting up a little bit extra cash than you would for a two-year deal. Make it a three-year with the second, with the third year being an opt-out on the player's side. Let him have that choice if that's what he's really up for. But if you give him that player option, it's going to mean that you're going to save a little bit more money in the long run. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, they might want to have him obviously for more. That's a fair point for more than just one season with the opt-out there. I was, I was more thinking of that from. <clears throat> the player side than the general manager side from, from from you taking it from that side. That's definitely a very valid point. I could definitely see them wanting to do that. But um, as we move on from Trevor's story, before we move into some of the key moves made, uh, you guys do also have a key outfielder I wanted to ask you about, because obviously you have Kyle Lewis and you have Mitchie two bags out there. You have Jarek Kelnick. Everybody knows those three. <laughs> um, but Mitch two bags. I've never, I've not heard that nickname and I love that. That's, that's fantastic. <laughs> We just call him Meech over here in Seattle. <laughs> but um, you also have Taylor Trammell, who's still a guy mm-hmm. I really like from the left side that's coming along slower than people expected, but he still hit the eight home runs and showed his pop and showed his ability, has been good in the minor leagues. Um, What's your take on him? Because he's still really young, only 24, just kind of entering his prime years. I always consider 24 to like – 27 whenever the guy kind of first hits it depending on the player and then depending on the player they kind of go to their age 30 to 34 season when they kind of end that prime depending how good their prime peak is uh T- Trammell seems like he's someone that's just kind of entering where he's going to start really progressing these next couple seasons what's your take though from an inside perspective of being a fan that's out there in Seattle on him so I really like Taylor Trammell. Trammell is a guy that I really want to see him do well. He's got a good glove on him. He's got great speed and a great end. So big, pretty good pop on the bat, too. Like, I will never knock him on any of those things. The one thing I will say that's a problem, and it's nothing that he's done overall, is that he's in a pretty bad situation if he wants to be the starter. Because right now he is in an outfield that is about to become very crowded very quickly. Like you said right now, you've already got Kyle Lewis. You've already got, what'd you call him? What'd you call him? Mitch Two Bags? So yeah, like Mitch that. Two Bags. Then you have Julio yeah. Rodriguez down below. Yeah, yeah that's, so got... that's exactly it. Is that you got Kelnick, who's really trying to prove himself, and you got Julio, who is right on the horizon. That they're saying that if the season does progress as normal, <laughs> that he has an outside chance of making the club out of spring training. Do I think it's going to happen? No, I think he's going to start the year in AAA. But. I do think that he has the ability to be that starting caliber right fielder. But that's that's kind of leads into the problem here. We just named, aside from Taylor Trammell, four outfielders right there. And there's only three outfield, sp- outfield slots. And Either probably at that point, dog. <laughs> do you really want to like, really try and have five 
outfielders that all of them are starting level quality, which, I mean, yes, obviously you do, but for a guy like Taylor Trammell, what the thing that he needs is he needs time. He's 24 years old. That is very young. Like, you say that a player's prime is from 24 to 27. I actually disagree. It's kind of when they that, kick in eventually. Yeah, it's kind of when they kick in. Yeah, so when do they get to the major leagues and when can they... No, I don't consider that their prime. I consider when they kick into their prime. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The there first you know, year, is. like, when they really get going is in between 24 to 27, and their prime ends whenever they kick in, depending on the player, in between 30 to 34. It just depends how long your prime peak goes. Gotcha, yeah. And unless no. you're aging belts right, you just say, screw everybody, I'm hitting <laughs> until I'm full. Or will, Nelson Cruz. I, I will yeah. hit until I'm in the ground. Anyway, but um, no, that's kind of the thing right now. Where he needs right at this moment is at-bats. He needs to kind of mature a little bit more, because I, I don't think he has any character issues, but he does need to get more at time in the game. The more pitches you see, the more at-bats you take, the more plays you get in the field, that builds experience, then that builds confidence. And that's something that is so hard to get if you're playing on the bench. Because it, as much as it's really good to say that, yes, you're on the Major League team, but if you're playing one out of every seven days, you're not getting much. You're getting the experience of being in the big league ball club. Yeah, but if they've already got four guys that they plan to be starting that point where, you know, you're more than likely going to have uh, Kellenick at center, uh, Lewis in the left, and potentially Julio uh, slash Mitch Hanniger at right, and the other one probably DHing. That doesn't leave a whole lot of room for Tremel. So for That's Taylor, true. so what I see with Taylor right now is he's going to be in AAA a little bit longer. He's going to be that depth guy for right now until he really starts to break out in AAA. Then they bring him up to try and be that spot here, potentially while they're still waiting for Julio to come up, and that's where he's going to try and make his name. Okay, because I was going to ask, since it seems like they're going to have the DH universally, I think that's something that will personally get done in the CBA, which is something Alex and I will talk about um, in the future when we do a more overall podcast than on this one. But my whole thinking with Tramiel is Mitch Hanniger's a very solid fielder, but he's not getting any quicker as he's entering his 30s. Um, I think Trammell is definitely, arguably, your second best potentially fielder of all those people we just named. So, if you want to go by that logic, you could just DH somebody like Mitch a little bit, and then you put him in the field more. But you also have another guy, like you said, if you want to develop Trammell, and kind of like I always have been a proponent of that, let a guy be the most ready. You're never 100% ready, but the most ready when you're fully up. And I'll let him go through his uh, issues at that point where you already kind of have a guy that fits the fielding in Fraley that just subs in, hits like 205, but has a little bit of a hitting ability um, when he had like, I think like eight or nine home runs last year or something like that. And in the 30s, RBIs doesn't have the best contact rate, but like he's a very good fielder. So one thing about maybe, Fraley as well that people never seem to talk about, and I think it's a cry and shame when it comes to Fraley, he is one of the most patient hitters out there that no one talks about. I mean, this guy last year had a walk-off walk. There was a game where he had three walks in one game. This guy is a Billy Bean dream right there, where his whole ability, yes, I don't have his exact stats right in front of me, but what he was a master of was getting on base through just taking as many pitches as he possibly could. Then once he was on base, he had the speed to steal a couple of bags as well if you were not paying attention to him. And then, again, he also has that glove. Like you said, he's a very good fielder, one that can really play well. There was one game where he robbed the winning home run and then it hits the winning home run, I think, another inning or so later. So, Fraley is really that guy that I see could be that number five. It's like the number five outfielder, which then kind of puts down Tremel a little bit further down the list. Is is Tremel better than well, Fraley? Think he was yes. Four, though, to start just, the season, just because if you think Rodriguez. Uh, will make, will start in Triple A, and then Trammell will get some grooming in Triple A. That would probably mean Fraley to start the season would be. Oh yeah, no, fourth. Fraley's gonna start the season. Yeah, Fraley's starting the season as the fourth outfielder, in my opinion. Um, and that's just again, that's behind you know Kelnick and Lewis and uh, Mitch. But again, that's not saying a whole ton, considering that we've also seen kind of the injury concerns with. 
Kyle Lewis, with Mitch Hanniger. So all the outfielders need to be ready basically at any given moment. And that's what I think gives a little bit more of an edge to Fraley in the short term, just because he's the one that is, he knows that his role is not there to be a starter. His role is there to be the fill-in guy and to do exactly what is asked of him, whereas Trammell has the potential to be a starting caliber outfielder. But they don't want to just waste him on the bench during these kind of peak learning years. They wanted to keep getting those at bats. So that's why I think he's going to start in AAA alongside uh, Julio Rodriguez. But right now, I think number four out of camp is probably going to be uh, Fraley. Yeah, no, I think that absolutely makes total sense um, structurally with the roster to do it that way. Um, Somebody I definitely have to ask you about, though, Alex, um, as – before we get into the moves of Frazier and uh, <clears throat> Robbie Ray and talk about how all those two fit in. Um, but Evan White, of course, he's one of the guys that teams are doing this more nowadays. Hasn't worked with my Phillies, uh, with Scott Kingery to this point. Uh, your Mariners have done it with Evan White, where they offered him a contract before he showed them anything major league-wise. Obviously, minor league-wise, yeah, obviously he showed good stuff down there, but major on the major league end of things. What, what do you think about um, him this season coming into his age 25 season? I believe it is. And uh, what he's going to be able to do going forward since it seemed like from my own opinion, once he signed the, one of the reasons why I was surprised by that deal was I thought they would then have to rush him up because they paid him. And it seems like that's kind of what they did. So like, I don't know how you feel about like what Evan White is going to do this year, that whole entire thing. So the big thing with Evan White, and this is what kind of is sad in my opinion, is that he really is kind of a victim of just bad luck. Because when it comes to Evan, he is a very, very, very good defensive first baseman. Which, again, normally you don't think of first baseman and de- defense being, defense you know, first. Yeah. yeah, you don't think of that often. But watching him play the position was fantastic. And that's why they signed to the deal. They're like, okay, We're going to let – fielding is something that's hard to teach. Instincts is hardest to teach. Hitting can be taught a little bit more. And so they're thinking, okay, you know what? We're going to work on his hitting. He's also – is like, yeah, we're going to work on his hitting. We're going to let him continue just to develop this. Let the fielding be exactly what it needs to be. And he won a gold glove. You know, good on him. The the hitting just never really came around. On top of it, he's actually got a good amount of speed, too, for a first baseman. Defense and speed are not the first two things. Yeah, especially a big third base or not third baseman, first baseman that's like two twenty and six three. Yeah, yeah, you don't see that very often, and so that's what gives him a little bit of credit. But the reason why I say that he is a bit of a victim of circumstance a little bit is because of another guy that came over in that Taylor Trammell trade trade that we just talked about a little bit ago. A little guy by the name of Ty France who has absolutely redefined what it meant to be a first baseman here with Seattle. He was not supposed to be a first base. He's a normal, he's a third baseman by trade. And they moved him over to first base when Evan White hurt his hip and was out for the season. And you know what Ty France did? He did incredible work, not just as a hitter, but as a fielder. He did not have an error for, I think, about three quarters of the season. Like, he was outstanding as a defensive first baseman, doing exactly what White, Evan White did, maybe with a little less reaction ability or a little less reaction time and definitely less speed. But he made all the plays. And he didn't, like, do too many that were absolutely spectacular. Yes, he did a few. But at, Ty France did exactly what you needed to do as a first base, and he did not make any real mistakes. And on top of it, he showed a tremendous power bat that we have been needing to see for a first base position that we haven't seen since Russell Brandian. Like, that's a yeah, little that's throwback a, that's there for you guys way back bat. when. Yes, that's, it's Russell Brandian. <laughs> But, no, Ty France really did amazing work. And, to be fair, that put Evan White on notice. Because, right now, everyone is clamoring, saying that Ty France is now the first baseman of the future. Which, now, CL has to try and figure out, what can they do with this gold glove first baseman in Evan White, who is, like you said, 6'2", 6'3", and can run a 40 in a pretty darn good time. What can you do with him now? You just paid him all this money. He still has this huge contract. 
There have been some talks. I'm not going to say this is exactly what's going to happen, but there have been some talks about trying to move Evan White to the outfield and see, just try to get him a little more. Like a Pat Burns type outfielder almost, but like exactly, quicker that can yeah. actually feel, yeah, like a little bit like. It's just you have to see how he adjusts to catching fly balls compared to how he fielded at first base. Really. Exactly. And so they're trying to see just, if anything, just to get a little bit more value out of him or just try to get a little more versatility out of him just to see, okay, we'll let you stay on the team here, Evan, but you need to show us that you can be more than just our backup first baseman. Let's see if you can also play the outfield uh-huh. whenever you can. Because right now it's looking like the team has basically already said that Ty France is going to be the starting first baseman of the future. And it's hard to be a... It's hard to be the utility infielder now, especially with guys like Abraham Toro, who have really came in and have basically t- is like completely taken over the idea of the super utility guy and made it in their own image. Toro played fantastic last year after coming over from Houston. And he's really shown that he could be another great starting infielder if they ever need him to. But even then... He's at this exact moment because no Trevor uh, Story deal has been made or any other deal has been made. Toro right now is your starting third baseman. So when you have all this mm-hmm. talent on the team, it really puts a lot of problems here for a guy like Evan White, who lost his job due to injury. Um, I, uh, he got Wally picked on the roster. That's what it was. And at this point now, what do you do with him where – if you ask me personally what I think may happen with White, I have a feeling the guy gets traded. I have a feeling this is going to be a guy where a guy like Trader Jerry is known for trying to move <laughs> guys around. And Evan White still has a lot of upside, as we've just kind of been talking about. A guy with no, I agree. Great, yeah, great speed, great defense, a bat that's still developing on that, and he's young, and you have club uh, control over him for, like, what, seven years? That's that's a, that's going to be a very attractive to a lot of teams. I think that there's a very real possibility that White might get traded. Yeah, I, I think that's a high possibility. If your team like the Cubs, for example, looks like you're going to lose Rizzo, um, bring in a young guy like him. You have Wisdom, who look like uh, he's emerging a little bit as a surprise prospect in Chicago land. That could be a perfect team. Just throwing that one out there as a True. possibility. Um, that could be a good team that it would work for. White kind of reminds me of not, now he has way more speed than this guy, but the way that Mitch Moreland developed into just being a great fielding first baseman that was kind of hit second, but would get those clutch hits for you when he was with Boston, Texas, or whoever else he's been with the, the A's and 800 other teams in his career. Um, so like it, he kind of reminds me of like the field first figure out hitting later, which is, guys that I always admire to have on the team if they can get the hitting going enough because that's how I was with baseball because I started playing baseball later in life. I never played T-ball, so I was always the anticipated fielding and then figure out how the hell to hit a ball better later, which I did because of coaching get better at doing to a pretty decent degree in terms of playing not at my high school team but just on like other levels. But um, I, I really like Evan White. I think he's a guy that probably will get traded, like you said, which would probably be the best for him at this point, just because of the roster structure, especially if they add Trevor Story, then it's 100% the best for him uh, because of the roster structure and the play he's going to get. And I think the Cubs could be the perfect fit just because it looks like they're going to lose Rizzo. They're a team that's retooling. You bring in a young first baseman. You have Wisdom, who I think is 26, maybe 27. So, like, you have a guy there – uh, Schwindel is another guy who I think they kept around. He came up at 29, who's been a career minor leaguer, who's been good in the minor leagues, and all of a sudden did well for the Cubs at the end of the season. So maybe you found a late-blooming extra outfielder in him. So I think bringing in guys um, like Evan White would just be smart for an organization like that, and that's a team that I could definitely see doing it. Or even the A's. The A's are probably going to lose Matt Olson. They're probably going to move on from Matt Olson. You're not going to trade Matt Olson, obviously, for Evan White, but if you trade Matt Olson for something else – you might bring in Evan White because he's a great fielder. You had Mitch Moreland on your team. Why not get Evan White, who's a young Mitch Moreland, and let him and develop him into the next Mitch Moreland? So, that I'll say one thing as well. There's one other comparison I really like to make uh, Evan White to, and uh, obviously not the hitting wise. The hitting again has definitely found this player a lot more. But he's very he very much reminds me of a Goldschmidt. Paul Goldschmidt, where again he's a good defensive first baseman with a lot of speed, and 
that's really kind of the archetype that you're really building here with Evan White. Yes, the fielding still needs a little bit of work, but we have seen that Evan White can really put back to the ball. Like, and when he does, the ball does, really does explode. So, honestly, I see that a little bit more than Mitch Moreland. I do think that Mitch Moreland is an extremely good first baseman and one that I honestly think could still start on some teams. But, I mean, hey, regardless, if you're going to compare to guys like Evan White, if you're going to compare to guys like Mitch Moreland and Paul Goldschmidt, you've got some good ability, regardless of whether you're going to stay with your original team or not. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Now, when we move on, Robbie Ray, um, great pitcher to add in. Um, one of the most fun pitchers to watch with the uh, every single time he throws a fastball. Um, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't forget the tight pants, man. Do not forget the extremely yeah. tight pants. That's the reason why he's screaming is that his pants are too tight. <laughs> no, exactly. But um, two years ago was a little bit more inconsistent. Won the Cy Young. Um, Last year, but he's one of those pitchers. I always like the high energy guys, um, which is why I've always liked the Strowmans of the world that kind of pump up, and sometimes the other team gets pissed at because I, I don't mind if you show the energy. If you if you got the guy out, do better next time. <laughs> um, where I always like um, Robbie Ray and the way that he shows that fire on the mound. He's just one of the most fun guys to watch for the grunting reasons. But he's also one of the more talented lefties in the game. Obviously, strikeout rate is absolutely ridiculous. Um, what are your thoughts on just how high of an impact you guys have been looking for a top-end starter for a while now? It seems like you might have finally found the guy post-Felix here. No, yeah, definitely. And I'll, I'll give a little quick little story here. I was actually at work when I found out that uh, Ray had signed, and I screamed. I was so happy. Because at this point, you're exactly right. This is the first time that Seattle has added a, a true to the blue ace since Felix. That's kind of sad to see. I mean, to be fair, Paxton was an ace with us for a little bit, but I mean, we before know how that kind of yeah, turned out. Yeah, yeah, and, and before the game. Yeah. Yeah. And so now that you have this true to the blue ace on top of it, there are two things that really make it even bigger. One, Seattle lost Kikuchi this year, which I'm going to be honest, I am fully. Fully okay with Seattle letting go of Yusei Kikuchi. He's a he's a pitcher, but he didn't sign man. before the lockout, did he? No, no, yeah, he he no he um he had a, an opt out on his contract and he took it, and now it's no, 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 I'm saying he didn't sign with anybody though. He's a free. No, agent no, 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 no. Right? No, he's still a yeah, free agent. Okay. I know that he yeah. he had been drawing interest from uh the Blue Jays and the Mets the last time I heard it. <laughs> yeah, I did see Blue Jays. I didn't see the Mets. Uh, I wouldn't um, mind. That's got him because I don't think he would pitch well for the Mets in the New York climate. So I feel like <laughs> I would I would not mind that. The I, Blue I Jays, I could see him pitching fine for the. But I I do a podcast with a big Mets fan, and uh, we've talked ad nauseum about how uh, he does <laughs> not want to see he does not want to see Yusei Kikuchi in a Mets uniform. And to be fair, I'm really with him. I think he would completely uh, struggle with the Mets. I think he would actually do decently well. With Toronto, exactly. Um, especially yeah. working with uh, Ryo Hyunjin, then um, I would love to see those two work together. That would be an amazing duo to watch. But um, bringing back the back here to Seattle, that means that one, you're you're down a roster, uh, sorry, pitching slot, which you already needed more people for, and you're down a left, even more, it's like even more problematic. And so you fill both of those holes with one Robbie Ray, with one Cy Young award-winning Robbie Ray. And I'm, I'm like you. I love the high-energy guys. The guys that when you strike someone out, you get the stadium jumping. And if the other yeah. team is... Well, I used to use somebody else as an example, but I tried to stay away from him as an example until yeah. we know about his off the field. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, exactly. Is, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the example I'll use is then uh, to keep it to Seattle is Felix Hernandez. Felix Hernandez did that a lot too, and it was really fun. But um, I love seeing that, and I think it's going to do extremely well over in Seattle just because it is a little harder to hit in Seattle. It's been proven time and time and time again. But um, even more so, though, I think that this is a time where Seattle finally gets an ace to kind of build around a little bit. And it really helps that they have these young guys that can start to really learn from a pitcher that, you know, has had some of those really down 
it's like down year struggles and has come back to not only become an ace pitcher, but to be a true like veteran that has been everywhere, that has done everything. Like Robbie Ray is that guy, and he's one that again, like you said, is one of the best strikeout artists that this game has seen in a, in a while. He's one of the best in baseball. And watching him really attack hitters, it really feels like every single time that he faces a hitter, it is a duel, and he is there to beat you. No, I agree. I completely agree with that, and you segued very well because one of the best strikeout artists in baseball in the bullpen is someone that's coming back this year, which is none other than former Philly, a uh, guy that enjoys punching himself in the face, um, Ken Giles. Uh, <laughs> where... Great show. I love it. Um, so, uh, what are your um, expectations for Giles? Because obviously, you don't want to overhype it coming off of the big Sir Tommy John. But we've seen people have said it now. Tommy John is not like it was 25 years ago or 30 years ago. The like universal. Oh my God, his career is over. It's more of like, oh, he can get through this. And some guys even have come back. Uh, stronger because, like Jim Salisbury said, our Phillies insider, when you rehab from Tommy John, you're not just rehabbing your arm, you're also rehabbing your mindset as you're coming back with your arm. And sometimes that makes you an overall better pitcher. What are your expectations for Ken Giles for this first season he's going to be pitching with the Mariners? So it's going to be interesting with Giles because, yeah, you're very right. Tommy John is not the beast that it was that long ago. And a lot of times it takes a certain kind of mental toughness to be able to go into that surgery and then come back as at even the same level that you were. But it's going to be really interesting for Ken because of a couple reasons. One, he's really been known as the ninth inning guy, the closer. This year, I don't know if he is because, especially coming off of Tommy John, but Seattle has their own closer that has done extremely well last year. His name is Paul Seawalt, another former Met, that has absolutely came out of the woodwork and has absolutely dominated hitters. So you have Seawall, Ken Giles, well, who else is also relieving in there? Well, hey, they still have Diego Castillo, who really tried to figure, who really started to figure out things Sadler. out the rest of the season. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm, getting, yeah, I'm, getting, I'm getting to some of these guys, but yeah, so you have Castillo and on top, you just had Sadler, who's another guy that people didn't even really know. And then the other one that, honestly, even I still have trouble I try to figure out how this guy is so good. That's Drew Steckenrider, who absolutely made a name for himself this year and is going to become one of these top bullpen guys. And yeah, he had less than 20 yeah. walks. <laughs> he had exactly. less than 20 walks the entire season. Yeah. That's control right there and that's ability to get people out. I love that. And then on top of it, then you add in the, the rookie, the young guy, Andres Munoz, who is... Again, yes, he's also coming off of injury. He's got to pitch, I believe, one game. At the end of this season, he's got to pitch, like, I think it was two-thirds of an inning. I'll try to see but if I can. I believe it was two-thirds of an inning. And, I mean, he is good. He's very, He's got an electric Correct. arm. He's got, great, uh, he's got a great slider to him as well. The thing that is a little worrying with him is that can he, one, keep his control intact so he doesn't end up murdering a bird on accident. And... Uh, or John Crook, but to make a little Ray Johnson connection there. But on top of it, can he also do it so he doesn't keep blowing out his elbow? Because that's the thing that a lot of young pitchers do is that we're gonna you'll have a flamethrower that'll throw a hundred miles an hour twenty times per game, and their arm is absolutely cooked by the time they're twenty eight. And that's what he's gonna try to avoid a little bit. But you take a bullpen. I mean, I just named right there six names. It's like four, it's like four, five, six names that all of them are guys that legitimately could be ninth inning guys. And a lot of them have ninth inning experience. Paul Seawald, ninth inning experience. Giles, Castillo, Steckenrider. All of them have ninth inning experience and all of them are in the same bullpen. I don't think one defined closer on this team because all of them can do it and all of them have succeeded into doing exactly just that. This Mariner bullpen at the beginning of the 2021 season was one of the most criticized and one of the biggest areas of weakness, perceived weakness that the team had going into the season. By the end of it, it was their biggest strength. And it's only getting better this offseason, and they've not signed one single bullpen arm. They've not signed even one. And we just named these... All of them could be the ninth inning guy. 
Plus, I'm not really sure if you have to because you have Diego. You mentioned Diego Castillo, but you also have, um, if you put him in the bullpen, if he can develop into a better control lefty when he comes back from his own injury with shoulder, is uh, Morga Vincus. And then you also have um, Johan Ramirez, who had a high four something ERA, but um, didn't have that much walks himself. So <clears throat> if he can get going better, he's definitely at least a good depth reliever let's put it that mm-hmm. way um no, yeah, that's what he is for your team. you're exactly right on that yeah the, like uh, Margusevich is a good reliever and one that i think overall like you're always going to want more lefties so if you're a lefty you're and you can throw then out. definitely keep throwing get going <laughs> but i think that this bullpen is going to have a lot of very stacked arms and it just is going to take a lot of the pressure off of a starting rotation that still has some question marks to it but to be fair looks infinitely better than it did in 2021. And that was from adding guys like Robbie Ray, getting the emergence of Logan Gilbert, who was a rookie that really dominated it exceptionally well. And then you also have guys like Chris Flexen, who get people... Like, yeah, the Flexicution are just the guys that will flex on them. Look, Flexen really killed it last year. I think there was a stat that came out that of, like, I think it was, like, the 25 games that Chris Flexen started, Seattle won 22 of those games. Like, that's insane. Chris Flexen is one of the most, in my opinion, one of the most underrated and most undervalued pitchers, sorry, pitchers in baseball. He is one that when he goes to pitch, the team goes in to win. (laughs) And that's what he's going to work with. Excuse me. I think it's because I've been having a cold recently, but I think it's because uh, Flexen just emerged last year where with the Mets, like Mac talked about it when I was still on the show, like he didn't do much uh, with their organization where now uh, with Seattle having their coaching staff get it going with them, it's clicked. Uh, Sometimes it's all about just having the right message, right? Uh, Where the last guy before we go on to Adam Frazier, who I think is overlooked as a starter too because he got injured. He pitched 11 games, and I thought did well. He just has to control the baseball a little bit better. You're probably fifth starter. Justin Dunn is still a pretty solid pitcher himself that's not even that old yet. What is he, 26? So, like, yes. uh, he's a guy that's going to continue to develop, and he has no pressure, really, if he's going to be the fifth guy. So he can continue to just kind of be in that three, whatever he was, like seven, eight ERA, um, and continue to develop from there and have the good strikeout stuff, but just try to become more consistent when it comes to the uh, walks. And then he'll, he'll, he'll be a pretty good fifth starter, at least in my opinion. Probably a guy that could develop more into a 4-3 if he can kind of get it hone in the control style side of it. So I, when it comes to Dunn, I think that his biggest thing right now is he still needs a little more time to develop. He showed last year that he, he had signs of doing well. Don't get me wrong. But I don't, I don't really want to trust him right now as number five. I think from what I'm hearing, Seattle's still looking to add another starter to the mix of everything and then have him compete for that fifth spot. But right now, if you've got guys like just kind of, I'm just talking right now off the top of my head here. Well, that might be like a Cueto though. If you're saying let him compete for the spot, because you would bring in a veteran coming off of injury. That's just me spitballing, but like someone that would also compete for the spot and it would kind of push the kid to try to compete with them proven even though he hasn't been as good in recent years but proven veteran that's obviously done it at this level like i would see that being more of a realistic move there well i don't see them going out and getting one of the better Mm -hmm. guys still on the on the on the market or trade market because then you're going to be holding up guys when they're ready to be called up or ready to go so very true because right now i see the rotation as robbie ray is the leadoff say as the opening day ace followed by logan gilbert Marco Gonzalez, Chris Flexen, and then Justin Dunn. That's why C is the one to five. Uh, however, that is again without saying that there is a, going to be another pitcher that comes into the mix. And I think that there very well could still be another pitcher that comes in. I'm not going to throw it out, throw it out completely yet. But you're right. What I'm seeing right now is that if it stays the way it is right now, Justin Dunn will more than likely be that fifth starter. But we've also seen that Seattle has done something a little more interesting where last year they started out the season with a six-man rotation. And it worked out pretty darn well for them. It was more just to try to get pitchers back to the idea of having to pitch 
the way that they did to try and keep them to last, going from a 60-game season to a 162-game season. But I would not be too surprised if the Mariners try to go with a six-man rotation once again, in which in that case, <laughs> then they definitely need to sign another starter, and then uh, Doug would probably yeah. be the number six. Because you're only guy that's pitched a couple starts um, that's mostly been good out of the pen um, was Watson, who pitched, I think, in a couple, like two, maybe a, a, a um, couple, a handful of The other name a that couple comes up, yeah. Games. The other name that comes up a lot with this is Justice Sheffield. Because Sheffield is another guy with a lot of starting experience. But if he he showed a lot of inconsistency and honestly has done a lot better yeah, than Yeah, like six something ERA, wasn't it last year? Yeah. It was not great. But he yeah. did show pretty good promise out of the bullpen. So do I see him as a number five compete starter? Maybe. But I like him more in the bullpen. Um, but if they decide to go with a six man starting rotation and they don't sign anybody else, I could fully well see that Sheffield gets the nod there. Yeah, we'll have to see. I think he'll be a guy that's definitely competing with um, – it'll probably be Sheffield at that point if they don't sign anybody else competing with Dunn at that point. It'll be whatever guy wins the job uh, from the left hand or, or from the right-handed side for Dunn and then from the left-handed side for uh, Sheffield because Sheffield is the lefty, right? Yeah, Sheffield's, Sheffield's lefty, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but as we wrap up this one, we obviously have to get to one of the things that is now overlooked because of the other moves. That the um, that's why I figured we save something that I honestly consider um, other than the Ray move. If they get Story, he'll automatically be the best move of the offseason, but potentially the best move because he's one of the better underlooked hitters in baseball. Uh, Adam Frazier going to the Seattle uh, Mariners, just adding to an already good lineup. Another hitter that's a great, one of the best contact rate hitters in baseball. Struggled a little bit when he got to the Drays, but I feel like he'll do better here. You have some gap potential in that Seattle Mariners stadium. So I feel like he could do better with the Mariners. But what is your take on uh, the Adam Fraser trade and um, how you think he's going to slot in to your lineup and where you think he's going to slot in? So when it comes to Frazier, I was extremely happy to see that Frazier was now a Mariner. Because I, a lot of times when you see an all-star player get moved, you think, okay, what did we give up? You know, what what high-level prospect did we give up to, to get him? And Seattle didn't give up a whole ton. They gave up a couple guys, but no real big-name prospects. So I'm like, okay, that's good. Where is he going to play now? Because he's a guy that's a super utility guy. He is one that pl- plays the outfield extremely well, but also plays middle infield very well. And I see him slotting into our second base slot because that's originally where Abraham Toro was without uh, when Kyle Seeger was still playing, which, by the way, Kyle Seeger's still a free agent as well. Um, Toro right now at this exact moment is the third baseman, and that's before any talk of, uh, of um, T- uh, Trevor Story getting signed or any of that fun stuff. But right now, I see Frazier going back to a little bit more of a natural position going over to second base. It's where he has a lot of experience with the uh, Pirates. And Seattle has shown to have a lot of interest in him back at the trade deadline. The fact that they were, there was a lot of talking, they were trying to get him from the Pirates at the deadline, but couldn't do it. Instead, came away with Tyler Anderson, who, again, also pitched extremely well with Seattle last year as well, being one of the most consistent guys, making sure that he pitched at least five innings. And for I think it was every one but one start, and it was near the end of the game, near the end of the season. So I think overall, when it comes to Frazier, he's a guy that is going to be able to play wherever you need him. He's going to be that plug and play. But whenever you don't have a spot that you need him to be, he's going to be your everyday second baseman, and he's going to be one of the guys that near the top of the lineup with how good of a bat he's been. No, I completely agree with that. Yeah, I would say he's like a second hole um, potentially guy there because I feel like with your team, you're not going to hit someone like Adam Adam Frazier in the three hole. You'll probably be hitting guys like Hanniger or somebody like that, but or even Ty France with the way he's more of a contact hitting first baseman than some others um, with the 270 or above average at first base. Uh, so uh, I feel like you might do that. But Tyler Anderson, who you mentioned, also could be an option to bring back in since he's still a free agent post-lockout to compete for your fifth starter spot like we talked about uh, with Dunn and Sheffield. Uh, he could definitely be one of those guys, has experience, already pitched well there. Uh, that can help push the young guys a little bit if you bring him back in. 
I completely agree. And I think it's going to be interesting to see what they do, trying to get another pitcher in there. Because Anderson did very well with the team. But this was really that first year of him actually doing that to a very consistent degree. And I think that he can do it. What I just want to see, though, from Anderson, if they do bring him back, is that are you going to try and keep him as a late uh, as your late of the end of the rotation starter, or are you going to try and bump up, him up a little bit more? Because we also don't know what Marco Gonzalez is going to do this year. We've seen him really go up and down. He was supposed to be the ace of the future and just never fully panned out. He has times where he's absolutely liked out. He's a genius of the diamond, but we've also seen times where he can't get out of the second. No, exactly. Yeah, Marco Gonzalez is one of those guys that has so much promise, but just hasn't reached the full promise yet. That um, if somebody can find it for him and get, get get him fully going for the consistent stretch and not just the great stretches we've seen at times, he has a chance to be one of the better lefties. But it's just you haven't been able to get it together yet. That's why I think bringing in Robbie Ray, who seemed to have clicked obviously last year and found that second gear um, to his game that's going to even help somebody like Marco to be able to watch him pitch every fifth day and kind of, obviously they're different types of pitchers, but just watch him from a compete level and like the consistent stuff he does going into each game and all that type of jazz. And I think that could help him out um, from that standpoint as well. A hundred percent. And that's going to be interesting to see going forward because of that point, there's going to be a lot of competition, especially if uh, DePoto does bring in one more starter because I'm fully of the mindset that competition creates the best in people, and especially in players. So if that's the case, then that's going to make spring training so much more exciting and a lot more intense. Because you know a lot of guys are going to be competing for that job. And whoever doesn't make it is going to be the long reliever out of the bullpen, which then at that point still just makes the, an already strong bullpen even stronger. No, I completely agree with that. I 100% agree with that. But I think as my good friend from Steel Flyers, Pirlo uh, Wisdom on his NHL show says, I'm pretty sh- I think that's our full 42 um, for right now, about 46 for this podcast. But Alex, uh, where can people find you and all your great work at um, if you want to share that? Yeah, so right now my where you're going to see a lot of my work is over on Spotify at Cheap Seats Chatter. That's where I do a lot of my podcast and we actually just did a fun podcast yesterday where you know during the lockout we're trying to find more fun things to do so we did a jeopardy style game show about mlb the show 21 but if you are looking for more uh direct sports news and all that go look through our archives we've got plenty of talk from different news things to talking about who's the best players of different generations and different positions all that fun stuff you can check out all of us at cheap seats chatter on spotify right now i'm taking a little bit of a break from writing just because i'm trying to work on a little bit of mental health but also just trying to save a little bit of time with uh family during the holidays but still gonna be trying to do as much as i can going forward no excuse me yeah no that makes total sense um I usually take certain breaks from things, too, because you have to take care of yourself first and foremost. I always agree with that uh, to the A+. Um, where, for me, uh, you can find me at JJBorick26 on Twitter, Flyers Nitty Gritty um, for different hockey coverage. And then, of course, I mentioned it on the pod already, but Steel Flyers, um, where I do a sports show every Monday. We record it, but it usually comes out Tuesdays at noon on Steel Flyers. And then on my channel, the next evening or the morning of Wednesday um, as the raw Skype version because uh, I don't know how to edit all the bells and whistles like he does, <laughs> so I don't put that into mind. Um, but I hope you all enjoyed this video and a pleasant special thanks to those of you that have subscribed this far. Subscribe over to Cheap Seats Chatter as well. Everybody does a fantastic job over there, Alex, Mac, and um, I, I, whoever else is still on with you guys um, <laughs> at this point. Um, so uh, definitely subscribe. Uh, over there and um a special thanks for everybody that joined please continue to subscribe down below and the easy to use sub button keep us going and growing appreciate you all and congratulations on the great acquisitions mariners fans everything definitely is looking up after a great season last year looks like it's even going to be a better one this year peace out everybody and stay safe